Babbitt by Sinclair Lewis. Chapter 25 1. He awoke to stretch cheerfully as he listened to the sparrows, then to remember that everything was wrong, that he was determined to go astray and not in the least enjoying the process. Why, he wondered, should he be in rebellion? What was it all about? Why not be sensible, stop all this idiotic running around, and enjoy himself with his family, his business, the fellows at the club? What was he getting out of rebellion? Misery and shame? The shame of being treated as an offensive small boy by a ragamuffin like Ida Putnick? And yet, always he came back to, and yet, whatever the misery, he could not regain contentment with a world which, once doubted, became absurd. Only, he assured himself, he was through with chasing after girls. By noontime, he was not so sure even of that, if in Miss McGowan, Louetta Swanson, and Ida he had failed to find the lady kind and lovely, it did not prove that she did not exist. He was haunted by the ancient thought that somewhere must exist the not impossible she who would understand him, value him, and make him happy. 2. Mrs. Babbitt returned in August. On her previous absences he had missed her reassuring buzz, and her arrival he had made a feat. Now, though he dared not hurt her by letting a hint of it appear in his letters, he was sorry that she was coming before he had found himself, and he was embarrassed by the need of meeting her by and looking joyful. He loitered down to the station, he studied the summer resort posters, lest he have to speak to acquaintances and expose his uneasiness. But he was well trained. When the train clanked in, he was out on a cement platform, peering into the chair cars, and as he saw her in the line of passengers moving toward the vestibule, he waved his hat. At the door he embraced her and announced, well, 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 by golly, you look fine, you look fine. Then he was aware of Tinka. Here was something. This child, with her absurd little nose and lively eyes that loved him, believed him great, and as he clasped her, lifted and held her till she squealed, he was for the moment come back to his old steady self. Tinka sat beside him in the car, with one hand on the steering wheel, pretending to help him drive, and he shouted back to his wife, "'I'll bet the kid will be the best chauffeur in the family. She holds the wheel like an old professional.' All the while he was dreading the moment when he would be alone with his wife and she would patiently expect him to be ardent. 3. There was about the house an unofficial theory that he was to take his vacation alone to spend a week or ten days in Catawaba. But he was nagged by the memory that a year ago he had been with Paul in Maine. He saw himself returning, finding peace there, and the presence of Paul in a life primitive and heroic. Like a shock came the thought that he actually could go, only he couldn't really. He couldn't leave his business, and Myra would think it sort of funny his going away off there alone. Of course, he decided to do whatever he damn pleased from now on, but still go way off to Maine. He went after lengthy meditations. With his wife, since it was inconceivable to explain that he was going to seek Paul's spirit in the wilderness, he frugally employed the lie prepared over a year ago and scarcely used it at all. He said that he had to see a man in New York on business. He could not have explained even to himself why he withdrew from the bank several hundred more dollars than he needed, nor why he kissed Tinka so tenderly and cried, God bless you, baby. From the train he waved to her till she was but a scarlet spot beside the brown, bulkier presence of Mrs. Babbitt, at the end of a steel and cement aisle, ending in vast barred gates. With melancholy he looked back at the last suburb of Zenith. All the way north he pictured the main guides, simple and strong and daring, jolly as they played stud poker in their unsealed jack, wise in woodcraft as they tramped the forest and shot the rapids. He particularly remembered Joe Paradise, half Yankee, half Indian. If he could but take up a backwoods claim with a man like Joe, work hard with his hands, 
be free and noisy in a flannel shirt, and never come back to this dull decency. Or like a trapper in a northern Canada movie, plunge through the forest, make camp in the Rockies, a grim and wordless caveman. Why not? He could do it. There'd be enough money at home for the family to live on till Verona was married and Ted self-supporting. Old Henry T. would look out for them. Honestly, why not really live? He longed for it, admitted that he longed for it, then almost believed that he was going to do it. Whenever common sense snorted, Nonsense! Folks don't run away from decent families and partners, just simply don't do it, that's all. Then Babbitt answered pleadingly, Well, it wouldn't take any more nerve than for Paul to go to jail, and Lord, how I'd like to do it. Moccasins, six-gun, frontier town gamblers sleep under the stores. Be a regular man with the he-men like joe paradise gosh so he came to maine again stood on the wharf before the camp hotel again spat heroically into the delicate and shivering water while the pines rustled mountains glowed and a trout leaped and fell in a sliding circle he hurried to the guide shack as to his real home his real friends long missed they would be glad to see him they would stand up and shout why here's mr babbitt he ain't one of these ordinary sports. He's a real guy. In their boarded and rather littered cabin, the guides sat about the greasy table playing stud poker with greasy cards. Half a dozen wrinkled men in old trousers and easy felt hats. They glanced up and nodded. Joe Paradise, a swart aging man with a big mustache, grunted, How do? Back again? Silence except for the clatter of chips. Babbitt stood beside them, very lonely. He hinted after a period of highly concentrated playing. Yes, I might take a hand, Joe. Sure. Sit in. How many chips do you want? Let's see. You were here with your wife last year, were not you? said Joe Paradise. That was all of Babbitt's welcome to the old home. He played for half an hour before he spoke again. His head was reeking with the smoke of pipes and cheap cigars, and he was weary of pears and four flushes resentful of the way in which they ignored him. He flung at Joe. Working now? Nope. Like to guide me for a few days? Well, just soon I ain't engaged till next week. Only thus did Joe recognize the friendship Babbitt was offering him. Babbitt paid up his losses and left the shack rather childishly. Joe raised his head from the coils of smoke like a seal rising from surf, grunted, I'll come around tomorrow and dived down to his three aces. Neither in the voiceless cabin, fragrant with planks of new-cut pine, nor along the lake, nor in the sunset clouds which presently eddied behind the lavender-misted mountains, could Babbitt find the spirit of Paul as a reassuring presence. He was so lonely that, after supper, he stopped to talk with an ancient old lady, a gasping and steadily discoursing old lady by the stove in the hotel office. He told her of Ted's presumable future triumphs in the State University, and of Tinka's remarkable vocabulary till he was homesick for the home he had left forever. Through the darkness, through that northern pine-walled silence, he blundered down to the lakefront and found a canoe. There was no paddle in it with a board sitting awkwardly amidships and poking at the water rather than paddling. He made his way far out on the lake. The lights of the hotel and the cottages became yellow dots. The cluster of glowworms at the base of Sasha Mountain, larger and even more impenetrable, was the mountain in the star-filtered darkness, and the lake a limitless pavement of black marble. He was dwarfed and dumb and a little odd, but that insignificance freed him from the pomposities of being Mr. George F. Babbitt of Zenith, saddened and freed his heart. Now he was conscious of the presence of Paul, fancied him, rescued from prison, from Zelia, and the brisk exactitudes of the tar-roofing business. Playing his violin at the end of the canoe, he vowed, I will go on, I'll never go back. Now that Paul's out of it, I don't want to see any of those damn people again. I was a fool to get sore because Joe Paradise didn't jump up and hug me. 
He's one of these woodsmen, too wise to go yelping and talking your arm off like a city man. But get him back in the mountains, out on the trail? That's real living. 4. Joe reported at Babbitt's cabin at nine the next morning. Babbitt greeted him as a fellow caveman. Well, Joe, how'd you feel about hitting the trail and getting away from these darn soft summaries and uh, women and all? All right, Mr. Babbitt. What do you say we go over to Boxcar Pond? They tell me the shack there isn't being used. Camp out. Well, all right, Mr. Babbitt, but it's near to Socket Pond, and you can get just about as good fishing there. No, oh, I want to get out into the real wilds. Well, all right. We'll put the old packs on our backs and get into the woods and really hike. I think maybe it would be easier to go by water through Lake Shaug. We can go all the way by motorboat, flat-bottom boat, with an Evernood. No, sir, bust up the quiet with a chugging motor? Not on your life. You just throw a pair of socks in the old pack and tell em what you want for eats. I'll be ready soon as you are. Most of the sports go by boat, Mr. Babbitt. It's a long walk. Look here, Joe. Are you objecting to walking? Oh, no, I guess I can do it. But I haven't tramped for sixteen years. Most of the sports go by boat. But I can do it if you say so, I guess. Joe walked away in sadness. Babbitt had recovered from his touchy wrath. Before Joe returned, he pictured him as warming up and telling the most entertaining stories. But Joe had not yet warmed up when they took the trail. He persistently kept behind Babbitt, and however much his shoulders ached from the pack, however sorely he panted, Babbitt could hear his guide panting equally. But the trail was satisfying, a path brown with pine needles and rough with roots, among the balsams and ferns of sudden groves of white birch. He became credulous again and rejoiced in sweating. When he stopped to rest, he chuckled. Guess we're hitting it up pretty good for a couple old birds, huh? Uh-huh, admitted Joe. This is a mighty pretty place. Look, you can see the lake down through the trees. I tell you, Joe, you don't appreciate how lucky you are to live in the woods like this, instead of in a city with trolleys grinding with typewriters clacking and people bothering the life out of you all the time. I wish I knew the woods like you do. Say, what's the name of that little red flower? Rubbing his back, Joe regarded the flower resentfully. Well, some folks call it one thing and some folks call it another. I guess I just call it a pink flower. Babbitt blessedly ceased thinking as tramping turned into blind plodding. He was submerged in weariness. His plump legs seemed to go on by themselves without guidance, and he mechanically wiped away the sweat which stung his eyes. He was too tired to be consciously glad, as after sun-scourged mile of corduroy tote road through the swamp, where flies hovered over a hot waste of brush, they reached the cool shore of Foxcar Pond. When he lifted the pack from his back, he staggered from the change in balance, and for a moment could not stand erect. He lay beneath an ample blossom maple tree near the guest shack and joyously felt sleep running through his veins. He awoke towards dusk, and to find Joe efficiently cooking bacon and eggs and flapjacks for supper, and his admiration of the woodsman returned. He sat on a stump and felt virile. Joe, what would you do if you had a lot of money? Would you stick to guiding, or would you take a claim way back in the woods and be independent of people? For the first time, Joe brightened. He chewed his cut a second and bubbled. I've often thought about that if I had the money. I'd go down to Tinker's Falls and open a swell shoe store. After supper, Joe proposed a game of stud poker, but Babbitt refused with brevity, and Joe contentedly went to bed at eight. Babbitt sat on the stump, facing the dark pond, slapping mosquitoes. Save the snoring guide, there was no other human being within ten miles. He was lonelier than he had ever been in his life. Then he was in Zenith. He was worrying as to whether Miss McGowan wasn't paying too much for carbon paper. He was at once resenting and missing the persistent teasing at the roughnecks' table. He was wondering what Zela Risling was doing now. He was wondering whether, after the summer's maturity of being a garage man, Ted would get busy in the university. He was thinking of his wife. If she would only, if she wouldn't be so darn satisfied with just settling down. 
no i won't i won't go back i'll be fifty in three years sixty in thirteen years i'm going to have some fun before it's too late i don't care i will he thought of ida putnick and luella swanson of the nice widow what was her name tanis jodique the one for whom he'd found the flat he was enmeshed in imaginary conversations then yeah, i can't seem to get away from thinking about folks thus it came to him merely to run away was folly because he could never run away from himself that moment he started for zenith in his journey there was no appearance of flight but he was fleeing and four days afterwards he was on the zenith train he knew that he was slinking back not because it was what he longed to do but because it was all he could do he scanned again his discovery that he could never run away from zenith and family and office because in his own brain he bore the office and the family and every street and disquiet and illusion of zenith but i'm going to oh i'm going to start something he vowed and he tried to make it valiant End of chapter 25